Hello, everybody, and welcome to Net History on the Network Collective. I just made that up. Doesn't that sound really good? That's kind of cool. <laughs> and today we are sitting here around the virtual coffee table. Well, depends on what you like to drink, I suppose, but around the virtual coffee table talking to Julius, who is in Paris about... All right, now we have to figure out, we have to come to some agreement. Are we going to call it Babel, 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 Babel? We don't actually know what to call this protocol, but it's a really cool protocol. So, uh, Julius, why don't you tell us how we're supposed to pronounce it in a Parisian accent, okay? <laughs> so, originally I chose the name so it would be pronounced the same in every language. And I didn't realize that actually there are two pronunciations in English. Nice. So, Julius, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do for a living, where you, I don't know, whatever, whatever you feel like telling us. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a lecturer in computer science in Paris at the University of Paris Diderot, which is, you know, in Paris, we've got like 13 different universities, and that's extremely confusing for outsiders and for insiders, too. So, that's just one of the 13 universities. And, uh, well, I guess a few years ago, I designed a routing protocol called Babel that has raised some moderate amount of interest. And I believe that's why I'm here. Okay, cool. So, Donald, I guess I'll go to Donald next because I see him sitting over there. Julius, I think you already met Donald in the past. So, yeah, Donald. Mm -hmm. Yeah, morning. Good morning. What are you drinking? Uh, coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing special. So, yeah, I'm Donald Sharp, and I work at Cumulus Networks, and I help run the free-range routing protocol suite. Uh, basically, I'm a cat herder. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jordan? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, I'm Jordan Martin. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Network Collective. Uh, in my day job, I am a uh, consultant in the data center uh, group of Core BTS. So, Jordan, there's like a little white thing right there. Is that on your shirt or is that your mic? This right here? That's my yeah. mic. Oh, okay. I was making sure. I <laughs> yeah. thought if it was something cool on your shirt, we'd want to see it. But it's no, not. no, I'm not that cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Julius, take us back 10 years. What is 10, about 10 years ago, right? When this first started? Is that a correct? A little bit less. I guess it was 2009. Okay. So take us back then. What was the problem you were trying to solve other than having a cool project for some of your... Uh, no, I was actually trying to solve a very personal problem, which was that I was teaching networking at the time. And I felt <laughs> fairly confident. I could you not. And I felt fair, fairly confident with most of my lecture. And there was one part of my lecture that I didn't feel at ease. It was okay, but I didn't feel really at ease with the routing bit. So I decided one weekend to implement RIP. You know, RIP, good old RIP, the simplest protocol, routing protocol that exists. Mm -hmm. And by Saturday evening, I was no longer implementing RIP. I was implementing <laughs> something different. I think that's everybody's story. Sorry. That's <laughs> kind of cool, actually. Implementing RIP. <laughs> no, 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 implementing RIP and then we're not implementing RIP. Yeah, that's... So, yeah. So, 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 by the way, Julius, we don't really consider a RIP a routing protocol anymore. We, we, you know, my saying always is, RIP is what you put on your gravestone. It's not what you put in your network. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's what you teach. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, first, the first thing I fixed was RIP bugs. The first things I did in router protocols were RIP bugs. So, it's a good starting point. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so you started out implementing RIP and ended up implementing something else, and this grew into to Babel. Babel. So a few months later, it had gone through a number of iterations. The protocol had changed a few times, and it became Babel. And then suddenly, I started having users which is always a shock the first time, okay? <laughs> Suddenly people are calling you and telling you, look, your stuff doesn't work in my network. And they are doing things you never expected reasonable people to do, but actually <laughs> they turn out to be very reasonable. And uh, so you rework your protocol. So you try to, you know, to hack around the issues they are having. And then you realize that no, actually that's a fundamental problem with the protocol and you have to redesign everything. So that way it went through a few iterations and got 
somewhat known in the mesh networking community. So explain, so explain this use case to us, because I don't think a lot of network engineers even understand the mesh networking community and what this actually means. I mean, what are you talking about? What was it I saw the other day? I saw a cartoon about mesh. I always tell my daughters their rooms are too meshy, but you know, that's... Oh, <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so, okay. So uh, mesh networks are networks that are completely unorganized, that have absolutely no structure that's built in, and that, that have the that, property... my daughter's rooms, yeah. <laughs> okay. And that have the property that some routers have only one interface. So if you're a traditional network engineer, you're going to tell me that you cannot route if you have just one interface. But in mesh networks with radio interfaces, it is quite common to have a packet come in and come out through the same interface. So um, doing mesh is not really complicated, but it requires some algorithmic changes. You have to make sure that your protocol is not supposing, is not assuming that the packet goes out through a different interface then you came in. So coming back to RIP, you cannot do things like split horizon in the mesh. And uh, you have a num you have some, and because the network is disorganized, you need to deal with the fact to automatically determine which links are good, which links are bad. So, so actually, when you go back to the split horizon thing, what's really interesting about that problem is, is that RIP itself relies on split horizon to guarantee loop freeness. It's actually part of the Bellman Ford algorithm, right? That, you know, there's the hop count thing, but there's also the split horizon that actually stops you in a loop from building a, um, from building a, a, a loop topology by j you just use split horizon to do that. So that's a fairly interesting problem set to solve right there. It's just thinking about how do you design a protocol where you cannot count on loop split horizon to do anything for you. So that's just, you know, for those who don't understand RIP very well, it might be kind of interesting to think about well, what does Split Horizon do in this protocol? And how does that work? Okay, so, um, in, so RIP has a major flaw, which is that in transient situations, it will build loops which can last for minutes at a time. Right. There's one workaround which consists, which avoids two, per, two router loops, which does not avoid loops that con are constituted by more routers than two, which consists in not re-announcing a route on the interface on which you learned it. And that's called split horizon. Yeah. That works pretty well. It avoids a large number of loops, but of course it's impossible in a mesh situation. Right, yeah. So, so you had to design around this, which is kind of cool. So I think you came up with, now you're probably going to kill me when I say this, but you came up with something very similar to, or that tends to look like the fusing update algorithm from uh, the JJ Garcia paper, the, the Garcia um, Luna paper. Is that? Um, so I didn't come up with it. I stole it wholesale. <laughs> <laughs> from <Refresh from Wednesday. laughs> two routing protocols, which are EIGRP, which I'm sure you've heard about, Russ, yes. and uh, no. DSDV. So the basic idea in those uh, protocols is to reject any routes until you, unless you can prove that they don't cause a loop. Okay, so routes, you just ignore any, any um, uh, route unless you have the proof that the route does not create a loop. And the problem right. with that is that you're too conservative. You tend to reject, you tend to find yourself in situations in which you've got routes, but you have no routes about which you can prove that they are loop free. And right. you need to do something at that point. Yeah, so in Babel, we call that situation starvation. Okay. And you need some solution to star 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 starvation and DSDV. Babel and EAGRP use different techniques for solving starvation. Right. So EAGRP uses a query process because when your FD is less than your RD, ah, now I'm going to slip right into this stuff. Uh, Nobody's going to yeah. know. <laughs> and, and so when your FD is less than your RD, you have no feasibility condition to meet or your feasibility condition isn't met by any of your peer or by any of the routes you have. Um, sorry, when your FD is greater than your RD or whatever, your feasibility condition is not met, 
then you don't actually have an alternate route. So you have to go into this query mode, which actually solves the starvation problem. So you solve this in Babel or Babel by doing what a little bit different, just curious. I mean, I know this is not supposed so to be explaining it, but go ahead. <laughs> the feasibility condition is exactly the same as in the IGRP. That's as far as I know, the best feasibility condition there is. So everything you said about FDs and RDs is exactly <laughs> identical in Babel. The main difference here is that in the EIGRP, when you reach starvation, and I'm going to make a caricature and I'm going to make you really angry, Russ, so please bear <laughs> with me. So basically what you do is you stop the world. You say, hey, guys, I'm starving. Let's reboot everything. Let's start anew. And you synchronize globally across the network, which works beautifully well if you have a well-administered network. We all know how well EAGRP works in well-administered networks. But sometimes this global synchronization process will fail. If your links are very unstable, you might not be able to synchronize globally to say, let's start a new. And that is the, this feature of EAGRP, this misfeature of EAGRP known as stack inactive. It doesn't happen very often in a good implementation of EAGRP on stable links, but because I was aiming for something that would work on unstable links, that was not something I wanted to put in the protocol. Right. So what Babel does is that instead of globally synchronizing, it will send some global data, it will create a new instance of the routing protocol that continue routing according to the old one. So there is an integer that gets incremented, we call that the sequence number, and you have the old sequence number routes that continue being used while we propagate the new routes across the network. And you know that those old sequence number, sequence number routes are loop free. So, so on the EAGRP side, stuck and active is really, <clears throat> I've come to the end of my state machine and I don't know what to do because the network is unstable and I cannot locally converge using the diffusing update mm -hmm. algorithm. So since I've come to the end of my state machine, I don't know what to do. I'm simply going to reboot the neighbor relationships until someone somewhere figures out what's really going on. And by and large, um, any EIGRP that's solved in different ways, but that's a different show. So I'm not going to go down that <laughs> path right now. We're going to keep talking about Bab Babel. We're going to get Donnie Savage on here sometime to talk about the history of EIGRP, which would be entertaining. Um, but, all right, cool. So you have this protocol. It's working. It's starting to be used in the mesh networks. Why specifically do you think the mesh network community actually picked this up and started using it? Do you think they thought it was really cool for the mesh network world? Or do you think that they just saw like something that was open source that was cool? Or I mean, where, where did that come from? I know it came from left field for you, but I mean, how, you know, what do you think they were? So you know that there are multiple mesh communities. Right. Okay, it's very meshy. So, exactly. <laughs> the, uh, the mesh community I'm thinking of are the community meshes. There are okay. people all across Europe and some also in North America who are building independent networks out of home routers. And some of those networks actually do work pretty well. And I happened to be in touch, in touch with that community, told them about Babel. They said, cool, let's try it out. And a few of the meshes decided to use Babel as a routing protocol, which was mostly important because it gave me some invaluable uh, testing. They did more testing of Babel than I ever, ever could have done myself. So cool. All right, good. So it turned out to work pretty good. You did all these modifications and then where did it go from there? I mean, how did it, I mean, now it's an ITF working group and, you know, home nets doing it and all sorts of other stuff. So how did it develop from being used in some little mesh networks that are this community based net mesh network, um, which by the way, is its own interesting story, right? This whole community based net mesh network, which is kind of this alternate type of thing where people are actually building mm -hmm. their own network. Um, not, I guess not because they want to stay off the grid necessarily, but because they're just trying to fly under the radar. It's just interesting to do. It's kind of cool. And, um, you know, it gives them an alternative to the internet where they can communicate with each other without having to rely on providers. Well, they are actually, most of them are actually interconnected with the internet. And some of them are actually the main means of access to the internet for thousands of people. Oh, okay. So I'm particularly proud of the deployment of Babel that happened in Slovenia, 
for a group called WLANSI are trying to build a nationwide network. So it's Slovenia, it's a small country. You right. can cross it by the local train in half a day. So yeah. For I guess from an American point of view, it looks more like a state <laughs> than a nation, <laughs> but still it is a country. And uh, so they're try trying to cover, to provide free internet access to the whole country using Babel. So there must be not providers or something like that um, in that area. Oh, the providers are very expensive. Is that correct? Oh, they have great internet access. It's just that there is momentum to do something like that. Oh, okay. All and right. They That's are. cool. Yeah, good. Yeah, it's always entertaining when people come over from Europe and they're like, I, I, this guy came over from Holland a, a while back to Cisco Live and we're in Vegas and he said, I think I'm just going to drop by Disney World just for a day or so on my way back to, to Holland. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah you let me know how that turns out. <laughs> Las Vegas to Orlando is not a short trip. <laughs> I'm but anyway, um, yeah. I'm I'm curious about the um, the whole synchronization or loop free alternative path. Um, so we talked about uh, we talked about EIGRP and how it you know deals with that condition where you know we're trying to globally synchronize. Like how is Babel different? And maybe you said it and I didn't catch it, but I just like so what does it what does it do that that avoids that that issue? So in EIGRP, you are running your routing instance. And at some point, somebody is starving. And the router that is starving is going to tell all the other routers in the network, let's start a new instance of EAGRP. OK, that's what the active phase mm -hmm. fundamentally does. In Babel, what we do is that we start the new instance of the routing protocol without shutting down the old one. So we carry routes that are indexed by an integer that says this is the seventh instance of the routing protocol. And while this, the routes indexed by seven are being propagated in the network, the routes indexed by six and potentially also five, four, three are still in the network and they are still usable. Okay? okay, They will end up expiring at some point, but in the meantime, they are still being used. So there is no distinguished active phase what you have is simply a smooth transition from the old instance to the new instance. So, so a known good route, even if it's exited the table, stays in the table until something better comes along to exactly. replace it. Okay. So, exactly. so long as it remains good, known good, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So it started being deployed in these mesh networks. So explain to me what happened then. How did it come to the attention of HomeNet? Or was that, I mean, how did that whole process turn out, Julius? Well, I'm that's due to the fact that Mark Townsley, who is the chair still for some time of HomeNet and who I believe uh, mostly started HomeNet himself, he's working at Cisco in Paris. And one day out of the blue, I received a call from Mark Townsley saying, would I like to meet and so I went to Cisco Paris, visited the, be visited the beautiful offices of Cisco <laughs> just outside Paris, uh, and spent a very interesting afternoon chatting with Mark and the engineers who work with him. And he explained to me about source-specific routing. Do you want me to get into a few words about source-specific routing? Well, let's back up even a little bit more than that, and let's talk about the HomeNet Working Group, um, because a lot of people who are listening to this may not even know what the HomeNet uh, Working Group is, and like, what does this actually mean? Um, you know, from the Internet Engineering Task Force, things like that, they might be completely baffled by that, even going that way. I, I know we try to explain this every time we bring this up, but still there are people, this is their first time watching, and they'll be like, home net working group, where's the home net working group? I don't know what that means. So um, I'd like to explain it this way. When uh, I was a student in the 1990s, you would have internet access and you would have a single host at home, which you would plug straight into the wall, into your telephone model or ADSL line or whatever. And uh, people were convinced that nobody needs to have more than, an more than one internet host at home. I remember that at some point, the Polish telecommunication put it into their conditions that you are not allowed to use NAT on the clients. <laughs> 
<laughs> because one host should be enough. One host at that time is enough for everyone, anyone. And if you want to plug in two hosts, you take to take you have to take two ADSL subscriptions. Okay. Nowadays, it seems completely absurd. We all have half at least half a dozen internet connected devices that are connected to a router, um, which is on the customer side. And all of those are on a single link. They are switched. Now, if you believe that uh, home networks are going to get more complicated physically, then the question is, how do we expand home networks? So one solution could be switching works fine. We can have 100 hosts on a single layer to link. There is no need to have routing inside the home. And, and the other point who did, of view, your, who did your grandmother call when her flooding domain crashes? Yeah, no. I know. We're, <laughs> on, we're on layer three people here. I'm sure. Russ, they're going to so, call you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so some other people think that uh, as we expand home networks, we want to have layer three routing within the home network. So at that point, you need to have routers inside the home network, and you need to somehow configure them. And the home net group is trying to build a stack of protocol, a protocol stack that allows complete auto configuration of all the routers that you might have within your home with no human intervention whatsoever. So that means assigning prefixes to links. That means assigning addresses to uh, routers. That means configuring DHCP servers. That means building the DNS infrastructure. That means allowing naming of hosts on different links and the names of hosts and, to be resolved. And, and all of that with absolutely no human interventions whatsoever, because you cannot expect the typical home network user to be configuring bind. And so now most recently, HomeNet has been working on DDoS open threat signaling for HomeNet, which is quite an entertaining little conversation that's going on right now about how you have home network devices actually talk to a, a DDoS open threat signaling or a DDoS mitigation server and figure out like if this network is being DDoS, how does it ask for help? Like if your home network is being DDoSed, how does it ask for help? So that's a pretty interesting thing. And I would like to differentiate a little bit between MANA and something like six low PAM, which is six, six uh, V6 over low power networks and lossy networks and home net. So MANA is more about, um, you take a small military unit, you throw them in the field, and they all sit down with, with, with man packs and they have to figure out how to talk to each other. So the network is very dynamic. It's not stable at all. And it is all radio. Um, there's very little wired in a, in a, or nothing wired in a man A network. And so it's more, it's more about <clears throat> ad hoc mobility. Home net tends to be more about a more fixed because it's your home, right? It's a fixed location. And then low pan, something like low power and lossy networks is taking all your light bulbs and figuring out how to get them to connect to each other and then be able to connect back to your home net so that they can reach the internet. So it's kind of three separate things. A lot of people get confused about these different, like how these different working groups fit together if you look at the IETF layout. So for anybody who's listening, that might be a helpful, um, a helpful way of looking at it. So, so Mark Townsley called you, you sat down in the Paris office, drank a lot of coffee, Got very yes. nervous because Cisco was looking at your routing protocol. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, actually, they told me about HomeNet mostly. So I told them a little bit about Babel. And then we went outside at the end and drank stuff that it was not coffee. <laughs> and uh, as we were drinking the other stuff, they told me about, about a technical issue they had in HomeNet, which was how to do source-specific routing. So the idea of source-specific routing is to have a very, very modest extension of next hop routing. So in next hop routing, you look at the destination address of a packet, you use it to index your routing table, and you pick a next hop and send your packet to the next hop. OK, we all know that. Now in source-specific routing, now in source routing, what you're going to do is to compute the whole path. And that gives a lot of control to the host, perhaps too much control. Now, source-specific routing is just a very modest extension to next hop routing. Just like in next hop routing, you are going to just compute the next hop and send your packet to the next hop. But rather than indexing your routing table by just 
the destination, you're going to take both the destination and the source address of a packet to find an entry in your routing table. That is, right. two packets that have the same destination might follow completely different routes if they have different source addresses. So the use case for this is, just to give some context, the use case for this is you have two providers in your home, whatever they might happen to be. Say you have your wireless phone like this sitting around um, and it gives you internet access one direction and then you have some other cable modem or ADS, ADSL link or something like that that gives you a different access link. But you may be able to access services over your mobile phone that you cannot because they're within the provider's network itself. So when you reach out to the global internet, if you go to like, I don't know, bing.com or, or whatever, you're going to find that either provider works just as well. But if you're trying to stream a movie from one of your two providers, you may find that even though your um, wired link is preferred routing wise, it's only reachable over the wireless link or something like that. So how do you actually tell the edge router, how do you route to the correct edge router in your network, the correct access point to get you to the right cloud so that you can actually get to that surface? And this is where source specific routing comes in because what you do is, is your host has multiple IP addresses and it will choose the IP address that's comes out of or works with the right provider so that now that the routers along the way can look at the source address and say, oh yeah, that source address belongs to this provider or should go, the traffic from that source address should go to this provider. So what you're doing is you're indexing on the source address rather than just the destination. So it's kind of a cool problem set. Um, one way of looking at it for people who are more familiar with VERPs is that you have multiple VERPs or multiple routing tables and you're actually indexing into the right routing table based on the source address then doing your lookup for your destination. I don't think I would implement it that way because that's very heavy weight, but it's just one way of kind of visualizing what's going on in source specific routing. But, the main, <clears throat> but the main point here is that it doesn't just happen on one router. It yes. is the dynamic routing protocol that is actually announcing source-specific routes and propagating them through the network. So your two providers, I mean, you quoted the example of the mobile phone and say the fiber box, are not necessarily on the same router. You want to have multiple routers and be able for the dynamic routing protocol to distribute those source-specific routes all across your network. Is there any concern about scale? Because obviously what we, what we now see is one route is going to be split up, you know, multiple potential paths, right? Depending on, on multiple different sources. So what currently is occupying, you know, one block of space for, for a destination now might occupy four blocks of space because we have four potential different sources all going to the same destination. So, yes, but you're only going to have source specific routes for some destinations. Okay. So typically it, only for default routes. Oh, Okay. Okay, so you're, you're going to have some extra routes. Those routes are going to be larger because you have source and destination. Yep. But that's not going to cause your routing table to explode. So okay. in a home networking environment, you're routing in software and RAM is cheap. Right. But right. even if you're routing in hardware, just having a few source, extra source specific routes in your table is not, cause, it's not going to cause your activity. The idea isn't to take you know, an enterprise routing table and make everything source specific. The idea is it's more around the whole home net idea that provide multiple it. default paths or maybe some specific things, but not to go crazy with it. You might do it in enterprise. I mean, the fact that you have 40,000 routes in your FIB doesn't mean that all 40,000 need to be source specific. Right. Typically you're going to have 40,000 routes in your FIB plus one source specific default route for every provider. Yeah. The, the use case that makes Julius very nervous is the data center. And Tony P and I have been talking to him about <laughs> data center networks and source specific routing and, and Babel. So you, you can just see Julius <laughs> like, <laughs> oh no, that's not what it was made for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've lost control. I'm no longer get to say that. <laughs> Okay, so Mark was talking to you about this. So he apparently brought it to the Home Net Network, networking group, or the working group, right, in the ITF, which started looking at it, and apparently that spread the community out a little bit. Is that correct? I mean, is that kind of how that became, um, started getting used? Now, how many years ago was that? I mean, just to give people a sense of scale for time, how long ago did Mark talk to you and start bringing this to the Home Network working group? That would be, I guess, four or five years ago. 
Okay. And so he told me about this problem. He gave me, we discussed that, and uh, it got me excited. So together with my grad student, Mathieu Boutier, we decided to try, try our hand at that, found that it was a little bit more tricky to implement than we expected, but a few months later, we had a working prototype. And naturally, we did the prototype within Babel. And I arrived at the IETF saying, hey guys, we've got a prototype of source specific routing that is fully general. There was a prototype earlier that was done by Marcus Stenberg, Stephen Bart, and Pierre Fister, but the prototype only did a subset case, so it was good enough for demos, but in production you would end up having routes that just wouldn't work. We did it in full generality. And for me, it was just a prototype. I was expecting people to want to use source-specific routing in OSPF or ISIS, and I never expected people to say, well, it works. It works great with Babel. It's done. Why don't we use that for HomeNet? Okay. And that launched the big argument that eventually led to HomeNet being adopted by, or uh, Babel being adopted by HomeNet, which I actually played a small role in. But, uh, uh, you know, my, my entire thing was we should have done both. But, hey, you know, that was the HomeNet decision to do one. And so that's fine. So now that led I'd like, to... Uh, I'd like to make a quick digre digression here, okay. if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's really cool to say that we want to have routing in home networks. Switching is bad, routing is good. And that might work when you're trying to explain that to an engineer. But when you try to explain it to the users or when you try to explain it to your boss, if he doesn't have a very technical background, that's a little bit more challenging. Now, one of the killer features of home nets is that it can use wireless for transit. Now, if, and that's something that's very easy to explain to someone. Okay, so you've wired your house when you built it because you had more foresight than I did. And uh, <laughs> at some point you realize that actually the most pleasant place to sit in the summer is your attic. And it never occurred to you to put an ethernet plug in the attic. And suddenly your daughter is complaining that she has poor Wi-Fi coverage in the attic. <laughs> okay, you would like at that point to avoid rewiring your home and put just a wireless router in the attic that, um, that creates an extra hop and that gives you better Wi-Fi coverage. And that is something that you can do if you're routing that is difficult to do if you're switching because switching with wireless is a mess. So what they normally and need to solve this is they do it at layer one actually, right? With a Wi-Fi extender, which we all know the problems with Wi-Fi extenders. You know, you have to be careful about the way they're placed and they use up an extra channel and to do the repeating and stuff like that. With this, you're actually still on the same channel potentially as your other Wi-Fi devices because it's just, it's routing over the Wi-Fi. It's just, it's routing rather than switching. Mm -hmm. And uh, Babel had good support for that unlike ISIS and OSPF, which would need extensions in order to deal well with lossy links used for transit. Right. Okay, so that was one extra argument in favor of Babel, as opposed to the more established route in right. protocols. Right, and eEGRP was not an option because eEGRP is not really truly a standard and there's been no, until recently, there's been no open source implementations for anybody to play with. And beyond that, eEGRP is actually a pretty heavyweight protocol when you sit down and look at it, right? I mean, it's designed for enterprise networks. It's really, like you said before, it's very, it's very well built around stability, a pretty stable network. And so um, having something like Babel is more interesting because it's newer, it's lightweight, you can add a lot more features. There are open source implementations. It started out in the open source world, so it's kind of a different dynamic as far as just the way it works. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we design our protocols, there are we look at them with various criteria, uh, criteria, but there is one bit that we sometimes overlook, it is implementability. Now remember that Babel started as a weekend project for myself. And the Babel RFC is 56 pages long, including boilerplate, of which 20 are normative. And Babel can be, if you're Marcus Stenberg, you can implement Babel in two nights. 
And if you're not Bab uh, Marcus Stenberg, you can probably implement it in less than a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jordan, this is your job for the week. Oh, you wanted exactly a coding right. project to play with, man. Yeah, this is I needed, it. I needed more projects. <laughs> There's plenty of open source projects that have it already. Yeah. But this just give Jordan something to do with his spare time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So let's. Um, I want to dive in just a little bit more on the on the lossy links. So what about Babel makes it good for wireless when it comes to lossy links as compared to something like an OSPF or a ISIS? So OSPF and the ISIS are based on um, our the fundamental reason they work as well as they as they do is that there is a very fast and very reliable flooding protocol that ensures that all the LSDBs are identical at all times. They give you no guarantees while flooding is in progress, but they flood extremely fast and very reliably. And that's difficult to do on lossy links. Sure. Now a distance vector protocol doesn't have this issue. It doesn't require that all routes propagate all over the place. Babel, just like EAGRP, guarantees, just like EAGRP in the passive phase, guarantees that packets are being pushed in roughly the right direction according to loop-free paths, even if it is reconverging. So if due to packet loss, reconvergence takes a lot of time, it's still not a problem. You're still routing mostly correctly, perhaps not optimally during convergence. Okay. Right. So, all right. So it went to HomeNet. It was chosen as a HomeNet protocol. We started the Babel working group. Um, and now it seems to be, like you said, you're out of, it's out of control, right? You've lost control. All sorts which, of stuff is going which on. Which is great. <laughs> which is absolutely great. <laughs> so in the last IETF in Prague, you said you have reduced yourself to being the scribe of the Babel working group. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this role. <laughs> now, what is really refreshing is to be able to have enough people who know Babel intimately so that I can, uh, I have enough people to bounce my ideas against. There are actually people who know the protocol sufficiently well that we can discuss technical details. And that's extremely pleasant. Yeah, I think actually that is the big, that's one of the big things that people don't get about the ITF is that um, honestly, you know, some of the projects are science projects, but uh, okay, m maybe a lot of the projects are science projects, but it's just cool to sit down with like Stuart Bryant and talk about ISIS or, you know, whoever, and just talk about what this problem entails and just getting into the technical details of the protocol itself and trying to figure out like, how do I actually make this work? Theoretically, I have a customer someplace. In your case, you, have, you apparently have a lot of customers and we're trying to expand your customer bases as greatly as we can, Julius. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's part of our job is to make your customer base bigger. Um, but, you know, that's actually part of the part of the coolness of it. And then the other thing that's happened recently is that there's now a Babel implementation of free range routing, right, Donald? I mean, that is actually, I think, I don't know who did the port, but um, I understand that it was you. So you actually ported it into free range routing. To be honest, I had a lot of help from um, Julius and uh, I can't remember the other person's name. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to give credit. So originally the port was done for Quagga a few years ago by Mathieu Boutier with my grad student, uh, when he was still a, ma it was his master's project actually. Uh, no, it was actually his fourth year project. And the code was still around. And what Donald did for various reasons, it went into Quagga, that went out of Quagga. And I'm extremely grateful to, to, Don to Donald, who dusted the old code, merged it with the recent code base of uh, free range route. Yeah, just, just to tell you, Julie, we don't talk about Quagga anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> we need our little Slack bot right now, Donald. <laughs> what's Quagga? <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So, cool. So, what's the future of Babel? What do you think is going to happen next? I know we had this discussion in Prague about a V3, about finishing the current charter items. So, in the ITF, you have a charter system where the working group is chartered to do certain work items, and then you really can't progress in new work until you built those work until you finish those charter items. And um, there was a lot of discussion about hellos and multicast and unicast hellos. 
and other things going on. So what do you think the future is at this point? Do you think it's um, a bright, glorious future where Babel is used in the internet core? <laughs> Replace BGP with Babel. I, I, I like BGP, you know. <laughs> um, so right now we are at a stage where the new specification for Babel is technically complete. So there is a draft called RFC 6126 this and this document is technically complete. There are some editorial changes, there are some administrative sections that need adding, and we hope to get it, uh, well, to get it into last call. Do I need to explain what last call is? Last call is where, well, it's working group last call technically that you're going into, right? I think that's correct, is working group last call. And so last call is basically the working group saying, everybody in the working group saying, yes, we agree, this is a good piece of work. It's technically sound, well-written, implementable, deployed. There are implementations that are interoperable, et cetera, et cetera. And then from there, it moves into IESG review, which is the internet engineering, I don't know what IESG Steering group. Steering group. Hey, you know it better than I do. Anyway, so that is all the working group co-chairs who look at it. So the security co-chair will look at it and say, are there security issues? And ops people will look at it and say, are there operational issues? And et cetera, et cetera. And then it goes before the internet architecture board just for like a telechat and some other things. And then it is, in that point, it's sponsored by an area director. And there is a document shepherd that actually takes it through this whole process. And eventually it becomes, it gets pushed to the RFC editor who assigns it a new RFC number number because there's those are an RFC number here but it's being bissed which means it's there's a new version being put together and then it's actually given an RFC number and then it's published as in this case I think it's experimental right still I think we're still no, it's a standard track okay standard track this version is standard track. this version is standard track okay so then once a standard track it actually is not an internet standard it's a proposed standard for some number of years and then, you know, if you look at RFC uh, 8200 that was just published this last week, then it becomes an internet standard after it has proven itself over a number of years. Some people say that the IPv6 internet standard took too many years, but I don't know that I agree. I think it takes a good bit of deployment experience to move from being a standard track. Once something is an internet standard, you don't want to be issuing BIS documents on it very often, if at all. You want to be issuing new RFCs that just do slight tweaks to it. So you don't want to be in a position at an internet standard where you're issuing multiple versions of an internet standard. I mean, it, it has happened. ISIS and OSPF, OSPF in particular is, is a case in point, but you know, that's kind of the goal of an internet standard is to say, this is not changing anymore. It's not deployment level. It's that this is not changing anymore. So, yeah. So that's, that's really cool, Julius. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I have any other questions. Do you have anything, Jordan, Donald? Do you want to like uh, jump up and down or drink more <laughs> coffee? Or? Yeah, what's next? You, we kind of floated around that a little bit. What, what are you actually going to work on next in Babel? So now we have plenty of extensions and we want to decide which of the extensions we want to standardize. So we have had the policy that all the extensions to Babel that we've done were published as internet drafts, that is drafts of RFCs. And uh, some of them we will want to push as RFCs and some others we won't. So clearly source specific routing is something that we want to become an RFC because it's being used. And uh, those are the next steps for the working group. Uh, there's some work going on around beer, right? Which is bit explicit in that, or a bit index explicit replication, which is a new multicast mechanism, which is kind of entertaining. I'm not really sure what the use case would be other than, again, if we start talking about Babel for something like data centers or something like that. But there are some other interesting works going on. But like Julia said, you know, will it be, will any of these be published as actual RFCs or will they be published as experimentals or will they just be or left as a draft? Or as peer reviewed papers. Yeah, as peer reviewed papers, that's still interesting work to be done. And there's, of course, the elephant in the room, which is security. Yes. So uh, for, a, for a standard track um, uh, routing protocol, obviously you need some form of security. We do have an experimental extension for security in Babel, which, is, uh, which does authentication, symmetric authentication in the application layer, which is something that some companies are not very keen on. They say we already have 
our, our cryptography stack. We don't want to be building in another cryptography protocol just for Babel. So right now we are exploring together with a student, Antonin Decimo, the um, following ideas of Marcus Stanberg and David Skinazi, the opportunity to protect Babel using DTLS or IPsec. So that's a little okay. bit more tricky than you'd expect. First, those, those protocols are not symmetric. Well, Babel is symmetric. There are client-server protocols. They expect to be using unicast, while Babel uses multicast extensively. And they, um, uh, oh, and they expect connected sockets most of the time, while Babel uses unconnected sockets. But Antonin is very good, and I have good hope that he will bring us a Babel protected by DTLS within the next weeks. Oh, cool. Excellent. So anything else, Jordan? No, I think oh. that's it. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Julius, for joining us. I don't know what time it is.